Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Contineros Podcast. The podcast is sponsored by Port Pro, the leading operating system for drayage carriers. Schedule a demo today at portpro.io. IOS? <laughs> and, and, and no. IO. You don't fucked it up. Let's start. Uh, okay. All right. We're, you know what? Yeah. We're going to roll it. We're going to roll it. <laughs> Schedule a demo today at portpro.io. Turned off his gain real quick, just in case. And um, don't forget to mention Contineros for 10% off. All right. My guest today is Miguel Ramirez. Hello. Hey, what's going on? So what are you up to these days? Tell us a little about Miguel. About Miguel. Where do we start? Do talk. Well, we had a little bit of a... Where do I even start? Childhood. Oh, well... Mm. What are you up to today? Tell me about you. What do you do? Let's go what with do that. I do? Yeah. I do a, I'm, a, I'm a trucker of all trades, I guess. A jack mm -hmm. of all trades in the trucking uh, industry. Okay. A um, little bit of A, B, and C. Driver if it needs to. Uh, I guess admin if I need to. Washing lady if I need to. Cleaning Ooh. dishes if I need to. Everything. So you name it and uh, and I'm I'm your guy. I know a guy. That knows a guy, and it happens to be you. And that happens to be <laughs> me. Everybody knows a guy. Cool. Nice. So, how did you even get into this, uh, this drayage world? How did that start for you? Your first experience. First experience. Yeah. It happened when I wasn't even. Uh, I didn't even think of becoming a trucker. I hated the truck. It started in childhood. It was one of the ways that I would get punished. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I was suspended from school, if I was suspended from anything, my dad was a was an owner operator way back then in the old school days. And um, the portaste mal, you're going to the to the truck, oh. and that's how it started. And uh, not before long, I started liking it. Like you know, a lot of people say that you won't get paid to look out the window. Tell them otherwise, bro, because you look out the window every <laughs> single day. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was uh, it was a little bit of a punishment, and I guess a way. Now that I see it as as grown up or adult, it was a way to also, you know, as parents, you tell them, hey, you're gonna do this, and you expect the kid to go to school, but if he gets suspended, you gotta take him to work with you, and yeah. not everybody has that afforded opportunity. So, yeah. it's you know, it was uh, I guess what they had to do, and just paint it that way, and then slowly I started uh, transitioning into. Uh, helping out the company that my driver that that my dad was driving for, mm -hmm. that were having a lot of uh, language barrier issues, like the lady then and the, the 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 guy that I was working with didn't yeah. speak English as well. So here I am, you know, a little youngster, you know, trying to make a quick dollar, trying to get into, you know, taking out your little girlfriends or whatever it is in in middle school and high school, just even for ice cream, you know helping them out sort out paperwork and making quick phone calls here or there, like on the interims between uh, between loads for my dad. Mm -hmm. And they would come, hey, come here, come here. Can you make this quick phone call for me? And that's how I kind of just got introduced to the whole admin aspect of the of the trucking industry because my dad was a driver, front lines, you know, going out to the terminals. And back then everything was done on paper. It was, you know, the people would check you in and everything. And... Um, first-hand experience for everything so it was the admin side it was uh it was uh the port side and then also the customers you know every time you see a little kid coming out with your dad it's like the customers will take a little bit of a uh, extra interest and be like hey what's your story what what are you doing what are you you know you want chocolate you want this they'll try to cater to you because they see that you're interested and you're motivated mm -hmm. so that's that kind of got me in the in the foot and and i kind of it kind of paved the way along the along the route and um and when it was my turn to come in it was like i already had you know backdoor access to a lot of the the industry uh mm -hmm. people so you go way back into this it's not like no nah, this is this is instilled in uh it's in the blood it's uh it's it's already it, it's you know i've been breathing this since my trucks had no no filters so i have already got enough uh fumes in my system <laughs> Yeah, I got in at like 19, started messing around with the port. So you like since a kid, since you, did a kid, your yeah. dad hauled containers? or He hauled containers, oh, yeah. um, and he used to take them. I used to tell him that uh, he had a 76 or 78 Pro Star Transtar. Ugliest truck you can ever imagine. Are those ugliest. the Chatos? That's the Chato. It's oh. a cab over, but it's ugly. It's one of the ugliest trucks you're ever going to see. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you don't see any any Chato trucks, any cab overs. Um, 
but when you see it you just know that it, it just it just has a signature to it and you're like damn that truck is ugly i think i've seen them with chassis wheels with chassis wheels yeah 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 they had the it had the the, the kind of center mass and spoke yeah, and stuff yeah. it That's was one old of those school they were, huh? old school 24 inch tires big lumpy no suspension no power steering no ac the windshield wipers where sometimes your hand just going outside of the window and just going mm. like this to it and in less um what do you call those the the pliers for the windows old school style oh yeah 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 yeah. the vice grips yeah the vice, the vice grips, grips. For the that's if you're lucky and you uh. didn't need it to go hold something down on the uh. on the on the thing if you were lucky yeah. then you had a you had one visor to two windows all you available know? to you that's it so in any any hardship that stuck with you from that young age that has influenced you or you know I haven't taken any hardship into it. Um, I think I took the hardship and, and just try to make the best of it. Lesson. I, I've tried to I try to influence um, and change mm. uh, with whatever little positive uh, notes that I can. When I see a driver out there struggling, when I see somebody that that has a bit of a language barrier, I kind of see my dad reflected into all these people, mm. and then uh, just go out there and help. You know, selfless. It's just gonna be out there. You don't expect anything. You just you know. I saw the struggles my dad went through. I saw the hardship. I saw his tears. I saw his frustrations. And it's one of those things that you just sometimes want to pay pay forward or pay back. Um, sometimes uh, if you're on the middle of the road somewhere and stranded, all you need is something very simple, something very yeah. basic, a fuse or, or a little hose or, mm -hmm. or maybe just a know-how. Uh, just stop over and, you know, just lend a happy, helping yeah. hand. And if, if, you know. It's simple, but just the fact that no one stops makes it impossible. Uh, yeah, it's a it's, for that it's moment. Mis mission impossible. And then sometimes with the moments of frustrations as your drivers or, or you know, because it's happened to me that it's like, oh, w w where do I find a little wire? And I just need to make a quick clamp or something. And I, if I only had something and somebody stops running, I was like, oh, you can use this from the floor yeah. or something. But you just yeah. blur to that. You're just like, just yeah. complete. Don't see it. You don't see the options. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah, those working on it together, it's. You know, yeah, once, once you a, get a little... I'm a Mickey Mouse specialist, I'll tell you. I, <laughs> I love coming up with shit, you know? One time se me rompió una manguera, a hose ripped, coming from Shafter. All right. And it was... The, the hoses are made of like three layers, I believe, right? Yeah. There's like that that orange looking, the, the end. Then there's that mesh, like a panties, yeah, the, like them sexy panties. It's a, it's a nylon. Not, okay. And then it's another layer. Of rubber, yeah. So that outer layer had ripped and you could see the... The, the the nylon yeah, yeah, the, the mesh, mesh or whatever mm -hmm. so all i did was just wrap it with uh, i put a, a bag literally a plastic bag like a condom, and, like yeah just psh, psh, yeah and then wrap that bag with with tape yeah. and then uh, the zip tie challenge bro Zip. put like fucking seven zip ties back to back and that <laughs> shit wasn't expanding at all i made it back mickey mouse it saved my Leaking air like a mofo but made it back it didn't it, it lock up your brakes it, it was a coolant it was a coolant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. All so, right, all right. It's flexio for that. I mean, not to not to do any of the infomercials, but I've been wondering if that shit works. That okay. shit that they just put over it, but I'm just kidding. Yeah, so they overdo <laughs> it, huh? Those yeah. fools are going to save the world with that. Oh, yeah. So it seems like. Asteroids coming, put some flexio on that shit. On that roof. You'll be good. <laughs> You'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> so... Not necessarily a hardship that you experienced, but by watching your father go through it, you adopted that, and now you yeah, I took action want to into it. Part. Yeah, I took action okay. into it instead of uh, instead of just saying oh, we're the victims of this or that. It's, it's standing up and actually making making a difference, making making somebody else that's gonna come down the line just their job a little bit easier. And if we could do that, that's all well worth it. Like, what years did you say your dad was doing the ports? He started in about 93. Okay. Were there any movements back then, like any organizations for the truckers? Like yeah, we... we owner ops, though. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for owner ops. There's been a couple of movements um, that yeah. have all failed because uh, in my experience or what I've noticed mm -hmm. is, is that some people give it their all and, and surrender pretty much their livelihood, their truck to a cost, to everything. But the people that they put to as leaders or, or the leadership of those movements... Mm -hmm have all reaped benefits from it and then just turned uh, turned you know turned away and and shined everybody off so i think it has benefited some people again it's not to single anybody out or anything but i, I think um 
it's been failed attempts in, in that sense, in the leadership and the organizations. Um, so a lot of people have, uh, they're very skeptical about any new movements that are coming about because they've already experienced it, I think, give or take three times, major times. Mm -hmm. It was one in the 90s, 95, give or mm -hmm. take, other one in 03, 05, and then 2008, 2010, give or take. And then this situation that we're that, that we're confronting right now with the uh, I gotta look into that because yeah. I cannot find any articles about that stuff. Yeah, it, it, because it, it's all faded away. It's all faded away. I really want to relive that and be like, kind of like to see what can change. I mean, humans, we always have this the way we are, no matter what year it was in. You know, the, there, the, was, there was there was a movement um, that happened in in 2000, 2003s, give or take where a lot of the people were wanting to unionize owner ops. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest schemes was take your truck to Fontana. Now, again, there's no concrete detail on this. Mm -hmm. This is just everybody's knowledge and everybody I know. This is one of those I may be wrong, but no, this no, no. is what happened. But this is what happened. Okay. Yeah. So the guys went over and they were told, hey, just go surrender your truck to Fontana. And then after this, we're just going to take uh, your name, your, your, your stuff down the list. And then you're going to become part of a roster type of thing, like a list for the for the um, for you know whatever ILW, that, that union yeah, was for, gonna for be. whatever that union was gonna be we're gonna get you down as the roster you guys are gonna come in as a-listers or whatever they went they surrendered it and that was a bunch of people that went out surrendered their trucks and what was the purpose of giving up the truck um so that company could have assets to fund so that there were there were there were it was just a collective of all kinds of owner ops and drivers um, getting together and unionizing or, or organizing it mm. and legitimizing it. Oh. And, and and doing so, some of those guys lost their house, lost their trucks, lost mm. their life, lost their... And, and by life, I don't mean they're, they didn't livelihood. kill themselves. Yeah, livelihood. their livelihood. They, yeah. they just... The, the way of living. And um, a lot of these, these people that lost all, all, most of them got divorced. And but yeah, a, so a lot of... Those no suicides, are, maybe? Who knows? Not 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 any that that you know, but uh, but people you know they're always skeptical about stuff like that because so, so that was kind of like a I don't want to say cult, but it's like you're giving up this to the movement. Right, right, your right. Your truck is now the movement's property, now, and and we're gonna structure it so you might not get back your truck, but you're gonna drive for the movement, and, and you're gonna benefit from, from it. From it, it from might whatever. not be your truck, it might be someone else's truck. It doesn't matter. It's the movement's truck, right? And we're making this big company for us, by us, for us, by us, yeah. And then but uh, give up, give us your assets. Let us make it happen. I mean, if with the good intention, it does sound okay. But it doesn't sound bad if you mm -hmm. think about it, because then a lot of these people were losing their trucks yeah. because they couldn't make the payments. A lot of the people, mm -hmm. diesel repairs and and everything, and you know. So yeah, it doesn't sound like a bad uh, like a bad uh, deal. It's yeah. just it was it just turned sour though. Once uh, what a shame! It does sound like it would have been pretty interesting if it yeah if, if it would have materialized I mean? yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. So those guys uh, might be on the run, or what do you think? No, every, there's some that are still very well aware of who they are and everything. Is as uh, I think their 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 little fifteen minutes of fame kind of came and went by, and it's just they just lost all credibility, and in doing so, they lost all credibility for the generations going forward. Yeah. Oh wow. So okay, it sounds like a. Uh, criminal organization when it when it gets to that point you know hand over your trucks give them up legally you think they covered their ass though to where they could they, they screwed everyone but then they faced no legal consequences maybe there's some fine print the guys didn't see you know i think the the, the set of laws was just way different they're not what they are now it's like uh right now people complain about every single thing and before it's like we see that throughout society. Uh, you got people apologizing. Look at Joe Rogan apologizing for. Look at all these people. I mean, look at look at us. I mean, we used to ride the street and and on the bike and everything. Mm -hmm. Te se era por pendejo, you know, it's like mm -hmm. yeah. Right now it's like oh my god, well, let's do the the bike company. Let's do this. Let's do that. It's mm -hmm. like, bro, what have we turned into? You know, it's it's like you felt for it's everything kinda, is someone else's fault these uh, days. Yep, yep, yep. There's no accountability for a lot of the stuff. So. And before, I think people were like, instead of making a big commotion, they're just like, you know, these are the hard, old school truckers that they're like, nah, it's by me, for me. And I think this is this is what caused a lot of the greed that's out there within the trucking uh, community. 
this is a lot of the thing. It's me for myself, and 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 I'm looking out for nobody but for myself. Yeah. Well, that's one of the movements from back in the day. That's one of them. Yeah. Do you remember another? Uh, the the second one was uh, was more of a not so much a movement, but it was a lot of people pushing forward on a small agenda to within what time frame? How soon from the other one? About five years, four Later. years, yeah. Okay. And then they started the whole cleaner program and everything. Oh, okay. All this just started, and I didn't think it was materializing because we had just gone through a recession. The, no banks were giving credits to anybody. Yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, a lot of people that 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 had pretty big companies, myself being not not a not a big company, but it was a small company. Yeah. Myself being one of them, it was just being ill prepared for for the changes that were to come. And then, um, you know, having said that, it's it, I lost my trucks, I lost my, you know, some of the accounts. I couldn't just, and there was just too much overhead. You cannot just go from having twenty plus trucks to operating with one or two port ready trucks, and it's. We have some of those changes coming up in the next year where a lot of these equipments that they made us buy in 2010, it's going to become obsolete. It No longer are they going to be allowed to, to go in and operate at the terminal. And some of these guys are going to have a hard time where they just finish paying off the refinancing of the refinancing of the refinancing of that same truck that they bought in 2010. Yeah, it's really hard to keep that financial freedom. Once you hit that mark, it's like, ya la hice, I'm good. Right. Now I can save up and maybe double down later or right. focus on other things. But right. I remember, like, I mean, it's just common sense. If you got that payment, the truck kind of owns you until you cover it. Until you know? until it's free and you and have the title in your pocket. Yeah. But what happens now? <laughs> You're getting the title and now you got to hop on another. You got to, yeah. And then not only that, there's, well, right now there's, there's two major crises that are going on or crises that are going on one of them is that that there's gonna start uh, asking for zero emission trucks zero this zero that and 2007 2008 2009 and 10 trucks mm -hmm. are gonna be left out of the terminals and all these people even if you try to go buy a truck right now mm -hmm. there's none there's none at the dealerships because we have a chip shortage yeah. because of the backlog at the terminals because of all kinds of stuff delivery is not taking place and it probably won't take place yeah to about 2023 so they're the saying uh on episode 16 i had uh two sales women from the rush truck centers okay and no they were saying that it's very real this shortage yeah it's a, it's a um, it's a true fact it's normally a true story. The, the customer would uh, order the truck and it'll take like five six weeks to get it on the assembly line once it's on the assembly line it was made in a day right that's right, how right. easy now, if you do the same process, it's a year minimum. Year minimum, and everybody that everything that's coming off the assembly lines is already kind of spoken for. Some pe somebody already bought it mm -hmm. upfront, cash money. <laughs> they said there's nothing on the lot. You can't go nothing. look at a truck on the lot. Like there's none. I tried. I tried mm -hmm. last week. I went to yeah. go look at 2022s, 2020. There's none. Um, no trucks whatsoever. So that's gonna just cost another type of headache for somebody down the down the pipeline that's mm -hmm. trying to become a trucker and now he cannot buy his truck because there's none there's yeah. none truck prices have gone up i mean we see even used trucks 2016 2017 double, double literally double mm -hmm. so uh, i had a question for you uh is legacy trucks the same as a grandfathered in truck is that just another word they use to describe it Legacy trucks. Yeah, and a lot of okay. those, and a lot of those are just gonna become obsolete starting next year anyway. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, I think there might be a last minute update, but I need to confirm. Yeah, th and I think it's it's still it's lingered. My, it's like mileage based or years, whichever comes last. Less than less than eight hundred thousand miles. Or, there, and, or and thirteen, no more than eighteen years. Eighteen years, the manufactured specific date. Mm -hmm. and they they give uh, manufacturers different one. Kenworth, uh, Freightliner, Peterbilt, all these manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They give a life expectancy of eighteen uh, eighteen years on their chassis and drivetrain and everything. Just you know, after that, get a new truck because of the wear and tear and stresses that that yeah. they perform. But um, those eighteen years, the, I think California and the port and all kinds of other stuff has reduced it down to thirteen to operate at the port. And right now, or eight hundred thousand miles. Or eight hundred thousand miles. So that means that my truck, I could have kept it if that's true. So right well, now, I'm, that, I'm that, going based on um, this is. 
I may be wrong type of scenario. Yeah. I need to look into it, but that's the latest info that. Yeah, it was just down like last week or something. Yeah, and that, so that, that, that'll be a game changer for some guys. Like, but some of these trucks, like let's just say that you are going to go out, out of state and find a truck because oh, yeah. there's none in California. If you go buy a 2016, 2017 truck, the low miles on, on trucks outside of state, it's, it's, uh, they're hard to find. Yeah. You won't you won't have it. So it, yeah. it's just uh, it's just a little ah. bit of a tsunami that's coming by. I didn't think of that. So if you so you could go buy one, but it's still gonna have high miles and it's gonna put you out before you. It's should. gonna put you out before or yeah. Mine was like five hundred fifty thousand miles. Five fifty. How many did you get it with? Huh? How many miles did I you get it with? I got it with like. Uh, I think close to 180. Buck 80? I want to say. You were the second dude on it? Yeah, like second dude, yeah. So this, this that, is after that, they sold it that, once that, and then that, they and then somebody... truck. No, no, no. This is after they sold it once, they got to sell it to you again. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, not the same one, but at the same company because I lost my my first one. So. You just lost it? Yeah. like I'm, I'm sure some guys can relate with the whole when dispatch starves you out. Because you don't know how to shut your mouth. Let's just not say so. st- starry. Let's just say strangles you. Yeah. That lifeline. Okay. No lifeline. But. All yeah. right. So, yeah, that'll be exciting to, to really validate that statement of the 800,000 or, or whatever comes last, the 13 years. Because I'm going to do. There's a couple of articles that are coming up and a couple of seminars that are that are that we should keep an eye out and actually be heard, you know, then that's another thing. Drivers. And share it with guys before they pull the trigger on getting exactly. rid of the truck. Exactly. And also, if you're going to get rid of the truck, then just make it proportional. Before th- this was happening, if we were not in a in the crisis we're in, the supply chain and all this, right. you know, the, the lack of uh, parts and all this stuff, you know, they would be like, oh, your truck's on the way out. We'll give you 10 grand and you're lucky. Well, there's there's no grants right now because uh, even the grant programs that there is available. Yeah. There is no trucks to put a VIN number to mm-hmm. it. So they're not. Oh, yeah. They yeah. stopped it. Yeah. They stopped it. My, 10, 10 grand. My dad, my dad was uh, was one of those. He started mm-hmm. the whole grant program and everything. Mm-hmm. And he got rejected because there's going to be no delivery in the near future mm-hmm. for the for the brand brand new trucks. I think the grant programs were okay. There were about a hundred grand that yeah. they were gonna do for the state, and you know, a couple of manufacturers that are actually uh, being proactive about you know certain grants and keeping certain things in line. But um, but they stopped because there's nobody yeah. to pay because there's no not a VIN number to associate to that grant. Oh, okay, got it. But like I said, it was that means right now that instead of getting ten grand because people know it's on the way out. The guys, if they do sell it, it's, now's their time. If they're going to hang up the keys, it, now's the time to get good money for that used right, truck. Right, right. I just don't want guys to be fooled into thinking that because no, your truck's your on homework. the way out, do your homework you're going to give it away. You know, and Someone else uh, on sixteen episode 16, they also shared a story. This guy sold the truck like shortly after he saw it online for sale for way more. Like. Yeah, you know he got I mean? cheated. He got cheated yeah, out of Yeah, uh, so let's do our homework because we got time to do homework. That's it. And, yeah. So you mentioned you had a company. W- w- what's the most you ever made as a company owner? Like, if you don't mind sharing, there's there really a lot of money, like they say? Like, it's not a lot of money because you do go through, like, the, the revenue is really high. It's it's high invoices. It's high volumes. It's high everything. Um, and, you know, I think it was about five, six million dollars. That it was around or around the time, but everything goes out on expenses. Everything goes out on, on payroll, on overhead, on you know. You How does name it feel it. To, to look at those numbers? Like, uh, you know what? When you're on it, you're not thinking about it. You're not thinking. You're not looking at it from an outside person. You're looking yeah. at it like. This is what I have. This is how much payroll is. It's, can I cover payroll? Can I cover this? Can I cover this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And instead of looking at being a third party or being somebody from an outside perspective, being like, damn, this guy is generating seven, six, six, seven million dollars a year. It's like, sounds like a lot. But once you see it. Proportional. Right, right. One truck, five grand. A hundred trucks. You, know, you name it, yeah. It, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. It comes with that same amount of losses. Exactly. You do lose. Yep. And and liabilities go through the roof. I mean, mm. not only are you responsible as as an owner operator, you're responsible for you and 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 the truck, 
and that's it. If anything happens to the truck, to this, you're responsible for it. But all of a sudden, you just become responsible for 20, 30 families that you're out there, that, that your trucks are out there. And that's a whole different headache. It's a whole different set of rules. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's just more responsibilities and liabilities more than anything. Okay. Would you be interested in doing another one in the future? Or, or the way things are going now, you kind of... I think I stepped a little bit on the on the side for, for a while and I was dormant. I had to kind of reorganize my thoughts and see where I wanted to go. Um, and I started helping out another one of the trucking outfits uh, that, you know, that's out there right now and doing pretty good moves. Um, I did my, my part on everything. Once I thought I was able to get back on my feet, I, I started to, and this is where, where it brings me at. Now I'm an owner-operator. I've got a couple of trucks running here or there. I don't think I'll ever want to blow it out of proportion again because I do like my sleep. This is one of the things that you recuperate as you level down or scale down. It's like no longer are you you wake up in the middle of the night in a little bit of a shock, like, where's the container? Where's the driver? Is he okay? It's like, what do you... What, oh. I'm asleep, you know, and it's, it, it, it happens a, a oh, lot, shit. a lot. You lose sleep over it. It's like, these are the things that some people don't talk about, but we go through it as, as a company owner. It's like, mm-hmm. you have people that are, while, while you're, while you're in bed and everything, people that think that you're resting and not doing anything. No, that thing is still behind your head. It's what if a driver this, what if a driver that we lose a lot of, a lot of people and, you know, different sides. And that's when you realize that your drivers kind of become your family. When you start empathizing and caring about it, you know, and, and getting more involved with everybody. And, yeah. you know, it's just sometimes you just cannot help everybody. And they say that as a business owner, oh, it's because now he's like this, he's like that. No, it's just sometimes you got to take back because there's more responsibility towards you. So kind of like leaving them on scene. Kinda, yeah, but <laughs> not literally, but yeah, it's in one, this it's, sense, it's like it's one equivalent. Of, it's, it's one of those, yeah, it's mm. like uh, unseen. It's not that I didn't want to respond. It's just maybe I was busy, I was this, I was that. And yeah. then by the by the time that you do respond, it's like, oh, what happened? You were too busy? You're too good for me now? And it's like... Yeah, if it makes you feel better, I don't even respond to my loved ones, right? <laughs> it may, like one of those scenarios. One of those, like, yeah. So how do you balance that with the with family involvement when you're running a big operation like that? Or even now, you know, like... How, what do you what do you have to say about there's work balance work life balance. work life balance yeah. that's that's been one of the toughest challenges uh, ever I think you just try to incorporate family into the business and fa- and business into the family you try to instill that and I think if you're if you're able to get that uh, within the tightness of the of the community of, of, of the family of the bond um, you're able to be very, very profitable because everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows what they're about. Um, it can be the same business, but different little windows to it and different channels to it. And you could so, tell them off and they won't sue you. And they won't sue you because, or you <laughs> or could just, or, or you could just tell them, Hey, let's go outside real quick. You yeah. come back, you know, you can squabble a little here, yeah. there, and it's happened. I mean, it happens <laughs> in the, you squabble and, and then you just come back, no hard feelings, you know, and and the, and the supper table is like you, you with the little shiner mm-hmm. and stuff. You're like, yeah, you got me good and this and mm-hmm. that. And you were right or I was wrong or, yeah, you know, but um, certain liberties that you cannot do with uh, with with employees or with general yeah. public. So work life balance, it's, it's something that you have to kind of incorporate both family into the business and business into the family. Like you have to make it. It's, it's got to be about about your life. If trucking is not your life, you're in the wrong business. Trucking is my passion, listen. Trucking is my life. I was a little dude from... Uh, <laughs> from what? From uh, Chipotle. Chipotle is my life. Oh, yeah? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> i never seen it, but... Never seen it? No. Sounds like it would be funny if I saw it. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's a little it's a little fat boy that he's upset about some burrito stuff or some burrito situation. I'm upset because you keep hitting that cable. I know. It's, That's the third uh, time. Yeah. Three strikes, you're out. Ah. Cut it. I'm uh, what about um, operating challenges? Um, mm, do you want to describe different scenarios, like an operating challenge about what we just talked about, the company you had, or operating challenges in your current uh, position? I think in general. Which are, yeah, we in could, general? We could, yeah, we they apply just, to both, huh? It applies okay, to both, yeah. and it's, it's the same because it's operating, and you know, regardless of, of what there is, it, we're in a, 
we're in a business and a very simple business if you want to put it that way yeah we haul containers from point a to point b and then right back to point a and it's a very simple business very simple pick up a container go to the customer unload it bring it back or vice versa pick up an empty go to the customer load it bring it back and life is simple too but exactly my so point but then but then we make it complicated legislation makes it complicated i think uh politics get too much in the way once oh. they once they see once they see too much of a good thing going yeah they want to regulate and take a bite out of crime you let know let me get a piece of that let me get a piece of that what happens uh just to get through the gate of of any terminal we have to go through all kinds of uh state uh regulations and and pdtrs and not this is just to get the green light this is not you know, just to get the green light at the at the gate. What's PDTR? The Port Reyes Truck Registry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that you can. Um, it, it's a registration. Uh, yeah. So database. The RF, so the RFID tag. So that can the RFID communicate tag with, can communicate okay. with them and whatever. So then okay. that 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 in itself is already two entities that mm-hmm. that have their piece in the pie. Mm-hmm. One, you need an RFID tag that you buy through Emoto. Yes. And then number two, you need to register that tag, and that truck needs to be compliant with um, with uh, CARB. Uh-huh. Once they get it approved, then you know DMV and everybody gets involved because they go down to the knit and grid of it. Your VIN number has to be uh, approved by the CARB. Then the PDTR registry has to give you the okay. Then you go through Emoto, and then you get a green light. Once you get all these three, you're you're able to go through the gate at the port. But then you have a concession agreement from Porto Valley. That's another five grand, four grand, whatever they're asking. Oh, twenty five hundred dollars. I I don't have an exact figure. Don't it changed recently. Don't quote me on it. Yeah. yeah, and that one expires every five years, and it just recently updated and everything. And then part of Long Beach, it's another five hundred bucks, and then that's there. Why Finally, do you think one is cheaper than the other? I think it's funding more than anything. I think mm-hmm. the city of Long Beach is. City of Long Beach is good. They 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 live off the land. They, they lease it. They're leasing it. They're doing. They're doing. They're playing their numbers a little bit different in mm-hmm. LA, and that's just again. It goes into politics. politics it goes real down. estate. Oh, uh, everything, everything. So, see, so it's not just containers. But it's not containers. It, 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 well, then that's that, some that, of it. That's some of it. Yeah, that, yeah. That's what I said. And, and and continue. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. All good. All good. In general, our our industry is really really simple. But we already had to go through three different, four different entities, five different entities, just to get through the gate. This is not 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 the speaker. This is just the front gate, so that you could get a green light. You get the PDTR. You got Emoto. You got City of LA. You got City of Long Beach, and then you have the, the CARB. There's like five different entities that you have to qualify for and mm. be all green light and get get everything going. Versus. Before it was just going into the terminal, getting a container and getting out. Was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no registry. There was none of this stuff. You just had to know your container number. You had to get a truck. You had to register it at the DMV, <laughs> and you had to know how to drive it. That's it. It was like very minimum requirements. What years? Do you have a time frame for that? Well, when my dad started, it was 90s. like that. It was in the nineties, and I think it started changing in about oh five. Okay. Oh five. And this is a time where uh, the port was only open one shift. Oh, yeah. One shift from uh, 8 o'clock to about 4.30, and that was it. And you always knew where your empty returned. It, well, because the, the ports operated differently. It was a uh, certain specific mm-hmm. uh, steamship lines to a certain berth. So all that equipment landed there all the time. So just sometimes by looking at the box, you already know if it's a MSC, you already know where MSC goes. And some of these ports are actually named after that. Like Yeah, that's what... Like APL. Yeah. It's all the APL equipment. Now it's Eagle Marine because they service all kinds of other steamship lines and everything. But mm. old school truckers still call it what it is. Vamos al K-Line. Yeah. What terminal is K-Line? ITS. El ITS. And it's, it's got nothing to do with K-Line anymore. It's just, you know, Al Costco. It's like 246 and, PCT. you know, PCT. But it's a it's trash not, pack. El trash pack. Es no vamos a decir nombres porque. Okay. I need a Tylenol. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was it was different. Um, I guess some the the systems. Just been changing throughout the years. It just seems that by now it would be more improvements rather than 
uh, you know, speed bumps. I think, like all this appointment systems, all this shit seems like it would be helpful. Like, and, and it's supposed to be, but I think they over police it in a sense of uh, just trying to find a way so that they can always blame the trucker for everything. Oh, okay. I think it's it's been one of those where, where they just over police it. Like security guards, they think they're super cop at the terminal sometimes. And, you know, it, it's just not the way it is. They're, they're there to keep certain peace, certain things, and not to be yelling at drivers like if it's your dad and stuff, you know, telling you to take out the trash. It's like... They yell because they're stressed out because they don't know how to organize a line. So they just send you anywhere and fucking yeah. scream at you. Yeah. And your ticket says otherwise, but they do. And then they don't they... want to see your ticket. They already know. They read your mind, bro. They're like, go. Over there. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they're, they're fucking savvy as fuck. They know everything. <laughs> they see the future. Con todo respeto, shout out to the, the kind guards that, you know, will hear The you ones out. that are actually doing their job, you know? Yeah. And the people that are there to help. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole different uh, subject, though. Shout out to the Gritona at APL. I don't know her name, and I won't mention it, but we all know who she is. You guys better watch out. Nobody nobody knows who, who you're talking about. La Huera de Xtay, nobody knows who, oh, okay. who you're talking okay, about. Okay. Yeah, no. I, I forgot who I'm talking about myself. Or the other super <laughs> cop over at uh, Trey Pack at the end gate uh, oh, on man. the little truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, But nobody's talking bad about him. Nah, I mean, we don't need a restroom. We shit in buckets, bro. Like, you know? Like, hey, this eh. one doesn't have a little foamy thing around it. No, it's... Uh, a couple of PODs because you can run out of TP and sauce. Oh, man, that'll cut you up, boy. <laughs> um, so if you were able to change one thing at the port and you know it would absolutely happen, like, it would be like one wish. I, right now, I'm just getting... You know, let's let's get wishful. Let's get wishful. Let's, like, let, let, let's, 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 let's get a Christmas list going. I think I wouldn't I wouldn't ask for too much. I think I would ask whatever is uh, fair uh, to ask. It's just that they do their job. I don't ask anything else. I just want them to do their job mm-hmm. efficiently. That's all I ask for. It's, and we don't want them to go out of their way. We don't want them to cater to us. We don't want them to treat us special or treat us any, indifferent or anything like that. We just want them to do their job. If they're there being clerks, be a clerk. But do your job efficiently. Mm-hmm. If you're there to be a signal, which is the people on the bottom of the, of the cranes, yeah, be a good signal, you know? Um, dock signal. A dock, you know, if you're there for, for whatever your job description is, be there and do that. And always, you know, the, for the people that are working inside the terminal, not everybody that, that goes into the terminal or, or not all the drivers have been there before. And I think that's one of the assumptions that... um that they have is that we traffic it in and out day in day out so we know it but there's new guys that are coming in and they don't know where certain spots are they don't know mm-hmm. if, if you work there and you know where the spot is and somebody just flags you down just you know kind roll down your window they, they're just gonna ask you a spot number just point your fingers even if you don't want to talk just point the finger give me the right direction and mm-hmm. and shut the way that's it so um, i think a lot of the uh, the trucking community is a little bit upset at that because now we got clerks that are complain about doing their job. It's like, oh, your dispatcher didn't do, didn't do the pregate, didn't put in the seal number, didn't put in this. It's, well, before it's like you would be in charge of that, but in turn, and this is this again goes a little bit. It sounds like I'm bashing them. In turn, they're upset because the automated system is coming. Mm. so they want everything to be done ahead of time for them so that they don't have to do anything which sounds like what but it sounds like automated does. already okay and but but yet they complain that they have to go and do their job you know oh, okay i see what you're saying so it's like okay so which one of both do you want and this is something that you know that i think i ask of of every single dock worker just do your job and do it efficiently you know mm-hmm. we understand some defense to that, from what I hear, is that they're understaffed. But and that and that and that and that can be true, and that and that might be true. But still, understaffed taking in information, it should only allow you know certain amount of time. But spending hours at the terminal without anybody helping you, mm-hmm. it's not an understaffed situation. That's a that's a somebody just doesn't want to push the button and you know talk. And then when they do answer. Mm-hmm. They answer with an attitude as if uh, you're ruining their chat, whatever they're having. In yeah. Their, like if uh, like if it's your fault that they have to leave the conversation and 
tend to you and it's yeah. like well that's your job and that's your job that's your job description you know yeah i do wonder what goes on back there behind the the speakers you know like eh, let's not wonder too much but not yeah. so much yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah not enough goes on so um that's what you would change then the way that just, they interact just, with you or just asking them to do their job that's it okay. i think i don't I, I don't ask anything extra or or anything you know yeah, like whether you're short staffed or not, it doesn't mean you can be kind to someone. Yeah, or just you can't be, do your best with and what not you even are. Kind, just cordial. Yeah, cordial. Just there's formalities, you know. It's mm-hmm. uh, I I've been at the speaker a couple of times and it's like I always answer, "Hey, good morning. Mm-hmm. What's so good about it?" I want to learn that word today. Cordial. What's the difference between cordial, 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 and, and kind? What, what, what kind is always expected to be. Uh, to be good type of thing you know you're always kind you're always this mm. cordial means that if you say good morning i'm at least gonna say hey good morning oh, even uh, okay. even if it's even if it's just a uh, formality okay i don't expect like i said we're not there to make friends although it would be good but we're not there to make friends we're there for a business transaction and but we're also not there to be disrespected exactly we're not there to be stomped on you know i'm nobody's punching bag either yeah okay that's a realistic request why not yeah and it's not far-fetched well um, i want to ask you do you know because some people don't know how it really works like they see you know i mean they think they go into the terminal and like the structure of how it all works you know what i mean like if you go to the starbucks you you want to complain the line is long and you want to blame the, the lady at the register but you're not complaining to starbucks for not hiring more you know what i mean yeah but that's just one aspect of it but overall the big the big drayage operation do you have anything you can share with us about how it works like i know my question is long as fuck look i'm gonna simplify it all right from the beneficial cargo owner to the consumer can you share a little bit of what that journey is like, so we could get a, a vivid? Uh... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a even take it back one one further. Okay. So let's just say from crude materials or from from. Yeah, awesome. So let's mm-hmm. take it back to even the 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 rawest of materials. You know, when uh, when stuff needs to get out there, it needs to get out there on a uh, by a certain time to meet certain deadlines. There's certain markets that go up and down and fluctuate on a daily basis. So a lot of the, the product that's sold uh, overseas or, or bought overseas is sold on the daily basis. It's sold on the market price for that day, for that, for whatever commodity, whatever commodity mm-hmm. that is. It could be steel, it could be finished goods, it could be whatever the commodity is. And it all tends to go with deadlines and, and with certain time frames. Now, in order to move all this steel from point A to point B, which it could be overseas, it could just be across the state line, across, you know, whatever, wherever it needs to go is from point A to point B. The, the whole supply chain starts as soon as you load up or, or somebody does a purchase. If you, need it, if you need your product to be moved from China, from Asia, from wherever it needs to be moved to, to a company down in, let's just say, Oklahoma, right in the dead center of the state, it's like, okay, this company here is buying goods from China. How do we get all those goods from China to here? There's where the whole supply chain goes. It's they got to get a freight forwarder that's going to make a steamship line arrangement or somebody with a steamship line to broker out a deal so that they can get the most efficiency out of their containers, their volume, their storage, and then get it onto the ship. Now, with from that being said, it, it's easy saying, oh, you know what, you have this raw commodity. How did it get on the ship? Well, there was a little guy right there, a trucker overseas, that picked it up on the container. Like went, us. went and did the whole the same the same four <laughs> time four time. Um, that that did the whole transaction, mm-hmm. loaded it onto the vessel. Now it's all manifested and everything's going. And um, and I said the example the other day. Once they load it up and and close it up and seal it up, they give you a bill of lading, which is pretty much manifested uh, information that gives you the description down to the T and the AES filings and customs filings and everything Mm -hmm. because they're supposed to have a 72 customs is supposed to have a 72 hours before it reaches international waters Mm -hmm. having said that a container is pretty much as a as a silent 
passenger on a, let's just say an airport or a wherever. It's just a silent passenger, doesn't talk, doesn't say anything, doesn't. Somebody has to talk for that for that passenger to get through customs, to get through the border, to get through everything, mm-hmm. to go through the whole process. And then somebody has to pick them up at the airport, mm-hmm. at the port, and then move it on forward and, and, and out of there. That silent passenger then has to get from the from the door of the of the port all the way down to its final destination where it's then unloaded and and product is then distributed and you know it it's got a whole supply chain now and the vessel is like the airline the vessel would be the the airline the steamship line we pretty much call them steamship lines airlines it's the same thing it's mm-hmm. just one of the transits it's uh, maritime which is ocean the other one is flight so it's air mm-hmm. airlines and uh, steamship lines for the for the uh, maritime freight. Same thing, same scenario. It's just think about it like that. So our job as uh, when you get that order, when you get that manifest in or that work order from the customer, it gives you a list of passengers that you need to move out of the, let's just say the port or the airport mm-hmm. at a certain time because they're all, nobody's gonna babysit them for free. Oh, got it. Then they're gonna start, you know. Then they then they're gonna start charging. Hey, uh, we gotta take care of these, and nobody's picked them up yet. What you know? Mm -hmm. That's when the marriages start occurring and everything. So you have a certain time frame to get all the containers out, and then not only that, it's like once they go and do do their do, get unloaded. Then you have a certain time to get the the containers right back in. So the the vessel, the steamship line, that's one thing. It's just the vehicle. Yep. And the terminal is a whole another operation. It's a whole different operation. The, the ship, the vessel, or the ship, the steamship line is the customer of the terminal. Yep. Right? Yep. So they're not related. Except they're not. They're not related except uh, for the management system, like managing uh, managing aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it's all third party uh, entities, as the union is. Um, they're just sub hired by by the terminals to come in and operate their equipment their, and operate their facilities mm-hmm. but they have nothing to do most of the time they have nothing to do with the steamship lines and and as far as fees collecting uh, the money collected from per diem is like a steamship line profit mm-hmm. that's a steamship line profit the marriage is a terminal, it's a terminal profit terminal profit so they're separate they're things. separate yeah you just see it like it's one container taking your money, yeah, but there's but it, but there's all kinds of different factors to it, and th- like that's what I said. It's like nobody's gonna babysit your passengers that mm-hmm. you know you just left unattended. Mm-hmm. They have to babysit them. They have you know is during within their jurisdiction, so they mm-hmm. have to. There's certain formalities that they still have to protect, and this is where the demarages come from. Because, uh, am I wrong for thinking this that now it's more complicated than before because. I want to ask you this: An evergreen vessel, sure. Back in the day, would have, you know, sailed to evergreen terminal. Right. Right. At that point, was the terminal still separate from that? It yeah. Was, it was just the yeah. name, right? It was just the a name. Is. It was just a name, and it was a way to, uh, to, I guess, it, different services. Uh, certain steamship lines automatically service certain areas certain mm-hmm. the pacific mm-hmm. uh some of them go to asia like we got a we we got the whole world right there the, that's a that's the floodgate to the to the world right there so everything and anything comes in and out of those ports mm-hmm. and um some are cheaper as well right some that some take are, longer and go the longer route those some cost are, some are less yeah and then and then there's also a a, a frequency if they're going there constantly it, you can also get a cheaper rate because okay. you know yeah. now they instead of sending their their own empties back to Asia because they need to get loads back over here. If you got an export, then they'll be like, hey, well we're going over there anyways. I'll just charge you this just to get the empty back and yeah. like diesel money type of thing. And if you're gonna be coming back with an empty, might as well get get something to load, and 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 even if it's just diesel money, it's you know anything is a profit. Do they make money on on taking empties back? They make money on recirculating their equipment, making sure that it's always flowing. This is why the mm-hmm. equipment departments at most of the steamship lines have a, such a hard time redistributing it and everything. And I think a lot of the stresses that equipment departments had was a little bit alleviated when the whole POP and all this whole chassis thing, because before they used to monitor the chassis themselves. Oh, okay. And right now they just kind of third-partied everything and then let a, let a, let a different entity take care of the wheels. 
So let me run this scenario by you. Let me know what you think. I, I heard that we ended up with a, a bunch of empties that couldn't be returned anywhere. Right. Because of this thing. Right. I may be wrong. Watch. They said that the steamship lines make money when there's a loaded container, whether it's an import or export. That's how they make money. They don't make money off of empties. Right. So there was this this surge. So they just ignored those empties. They weren't taking them, but they they took exports. They brought in imports and took exports. They weren't taking empties back. Is, could, is that false, or do you mm, see why it, they would choose there that? Is, there is some truth to it, but it, I don't think it works quite as... Uh, it's not that, that easy to explain. Um, I think what they had was a, was a big influx of all kinds of containers uh, of loads. So now, instead of uh, having 20, 40 spots per vessel for certain certain steamship lines, and again, I'm lowballing because these are in the thousands. Yes. Um, let's just say that you have a hundred slots available for operations at the, uh, at your terminal, whatever Lewis terminal is, mm -hmm. you have a hundred spots for, for, for loads, uh, for operations, empties loads, combination of, but now the vessels are coming in, are coming in, are coming in, and it's taking longer for your loads to go out. So instead of it being 50, 50, 50 empties, 50 loads. Now you're in a, like, okay, let's start taking less empties. Let's start processing less empties because the loads are more important. Okay. And let's take over this spot. And then let's take over, oh, shoot, now 60 is not doing it. Let's do 70. And next okay. thing you know, we let's got do them stacked. So now we got 70, and that's that's no problem. That, that's fine. But we still have 30 more empties, but now we cannot process any empties in because I don't have a place to put them. Now the vessels are still coming in. And if I don't put a little bit of a of a of a, of a leaf to all that stuff, they're gonna be stuck in the water. Before you knew it, it was almost a hundred percent of the terminal situation that was taken over by loads, and not enough space for empties. And then we have them spilling down to the communities. We have them spilling down to the middle of the street. Some people don't even know where to put them anymore. Per diem is gonna be a whole other issue once this whole thing stops. Because uh, the interchange uh, agreement states that whoever the carrier is that pulled it out is responsible for terminating. But, but if you're not allowing them to terminate, why should they owe the, you any money? But it's, the it's invoices, your equipment. But the invoices like, are still going to come in because they're done kind of uh, systematic. They're still You're still going oh, to have to dispute. Yeah, yeah. And you're still <laughs> going to have to dispute it and everything. And um, I think one of, the, one of the suggestions that I had heard from a couple of people was, okay, just the same way that they're charging us for storage at the terminal was let's charge them for storage for keeping their equipment at my facility because it's I still need real estate and yeah. if you don't know how much yards are around here yeah they're 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 eye gouging they they will because the service is done the minute you you you're done with that load you're That's ready it. to return it it's not our fault if right. you don't have a spot for me correct right? yeah why should it be free I guess this hadn't happened this bad. It That's had, why they're not prepared. I right? think it, it was a combination of things, and this is about this goes back. Um, I was asked this on Monday from Dulce from, can I say from Univision? She asked me, "Well, is this a new thing? Is this something that has uh, recently been going on?" I was like, "No, I think it's just been more in the spotlight lately. It's been on national news. Now it became a world uh, and amplified now. And now, now everybody knows about it. Now everybody's looking at it. Now you know, and 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 that's one of the things that that it's like until we shed light and until we start broadcasting or 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 giving our our thoughts, people don't know about the struggles that we have. So that that takes me into. Do you are you done answering the question yeah, about yeah, yeah. The, the the steps? That's more than enough for it, now. Yeah, long. it's it's generalized. And yeah, that's just some of it. And that's just some of it. But but I think that's the clearest explanation for for anybody that's out there that never, doesn't know how it works. It's the same thing as having a, a a silent passenger that doesn't see, doesn't move, doesn't anything, and sending them to the airport. You have to have somebody. It has to be in somebody's custody. Somebody has to intake that passenger, take him down to his to his airplane. Let's just put yeah. it that way. And he has to have a slot. He has to have a slot, a seat, put his seatbelt mm -hmm. on, get everything, 
make sure that when he gets off, there's a wheelchair right there for him at the mm-hmm. at the thing, taking him over to the front gate, and then whoever's going to claim him. Waiting for that Uber to come and get him out. But Uber, it's not that easy. Uber has to get off the truck and go and, and, and show documentation and tell him, that's my passenger. And he needs an appointment. And he needs an appointment, and you need all kinds of stuff. So now it just... But there's no wheelchairs to sit, to sit Mr. Container on. <laughs> there's not enough wheelchairs. <laughs> there's not enough. See, there's a ton of other stuff, man. Yeah. But you mentioned um, the Dulce and... Um, Univision. Yeah, the whole speaking out about this and putting it out there. Right. Now that it's on everyone's mind and everyone... Because when it started, we were essential and now we're making too much noise and, well, what, and, and what, we're dirty, you know. Yeah, I think this this happened because, uh, uh, as you know, especially when... Uh, when commodities need to move, uh, such as PPEs and all this uh, sanitizer and all this stuff, is like we can make the the laws change. We can make the changes, and we can um, we can uh, in essence um, eliminate the hours of service too. They they did a couple of those things for the routes. They mm-hmm. they amplified uh, from a hundred miles uh, for local drivers to a hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. Uh, they 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 do the changes when it needs to or when it's on the spotlight. But when it's on a regular day that you know people don't are not are not yeah, being at the, sought at the end, with, someone always wants to look good, like yep. they're doing something. So that that the changes can be made, yes, they can. It's just how do we get that done and efficiently, and making sure that everybody's to to the best of uh well benefited in some mm-hmm. kind of way, you know. Um, I think one of the biggest influxes right now also is with the communities. I think we saw that damn cool stuff. Yes. Uh, Wilmington. Yes. And I know there's a couple of uh, places out in Jerupa Valley and Inland Empire that are pretty much tired of all the high traffic and all the stuff from the from the truckers and from all the commotion that we cause as we go through their communities. But it's... It's the only routes that there is. I we mean, get caught between it. Yeah, we get caught between, and now we have community people that are thinking that we're just going over there and, and destroying their property, just you know, lowering their, their house values and all this other stuff, when in reality, there's no other route for us to take. There's yeah. no, you know, we have no alternative. Sometimes you go through, like, two, three different cities. Right. There's those little scenarios where right. there's little one block of... Of Santa Fe Springs and then one block of of Norwalk yeah. and uh, the other you know smaller and I understand it and I think um, I was ex- it was explained to me this morning that the reason for that is because where the main warehouses or where the places are established those are the cities that are benefiting from that revenue from that from that place but all the other cities in between they get no budget for fixing the streets for fixing the street lights. For for oh. the infrastructure, for the damages that we cause as we go through their communities and to everything, get to, the other city to get to the city, so that reaps the incentives. So. Correct. So, so there's there's a certain city that's benefiting, oh. but the neighboring cities they don't get any of those funds. If they want that, why don't they just say that? Why is it gotta be that truckers are bad and? Well, they are bad in essence to yeah. their community. Yeah. But we're we're not saying that we're delivering essential goods. To the warehouse so it can be distributed so that, you know, the local household does not go off their basket, you know. They need their essentials. They need their toilet paper. They need the cleaning supplies. They, you need your yeah. Nikes. You need your, you know, you need your stuff. There's, yeah. there's just basic needs that, that that are being distributed through those warehouses. And they ain't going to stop buying stuff anytime soon. So. Right. And that's, a, that's another thing. It's like everybody's buying online now. So I think one of the one of the proposals that I had heard from uh, from from one of these um somebody in a, in a high position was well get smaller trucks so that they don't mess up the streets going through and out of there if these big companies are sponsoring or or they're the beneficial cargo owners in essence like the teslas the walmarts the um, home depots uh, you know if they're the ones that are benefiting from this might as well just have them do it on smaller lighter units you know instead of it being done on one truckload they could just do several of these smaller trucks, and then it would, it would cause less um, less damage to the road. And then I said, but it's going to cause more, more traffic. Yes. And, you know, the, then, you, you know, we pay road taxes. Again, we go back to the road taxes. We pay taxes galore just to keep our, our trucks on the road. Why shouldn't I reap the benefits of having a nice road to travel to my warehouse? I mean, 
if we're unaware, we just have to find a way to mutually work together, you know, communities and 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 truckers. And I guess having having outreach programs for from the city or from the government officials mm -hmm. so that they can reach out and, and give us alternate routes or give us specific routes where they can do the infrastructure to support more weight, certain, you know, certain things that can be done. I'm confused about something and I don't know. When I got there, I was like, what's going on? I, um, there was this this uh, post going around that there's going to be a, a, a city council meeting and it's a public hearing in regards to the noise and the damage that the truckers do on their way to Damco, Santa Fe Springs. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, they're... Because we had just gone through that whole Drum Street and Wilmington and those guys right, complaining. Right, right. So now there's these guys complaining. You know, like last year we're essential. Now we're noisy and annoying and fucking your street up. Cool. But we wanted to know what's going on. So I, I got the meeting ID and all that good stuff. And I logged into Zoom and right. I attended. But uh, what, I just, I was there like an hour. But I saw nothing about the trucks. I, all I saw is businessmen proposing, uh, seeking the approval and authorization for building. For building. So, do you think? See, because I'm I'm new to this stuff. I'm I'm, but I'm curious. I'm is it, you know something ain't right. So I'm like, are they, are they? Is someone strategically making it seem like it's about the truckers? Because if you get rid of the truckers, now your your value of your homes goes up because it's a quiet neighborhood, or how could they play that card? Because. No, I'm not sorry, I, sure. What I, the fuck does, does the trucker <laughs> have to do with you building a property there? No, it it, it it's got a it, it's a little bit different than that, but it does have to do with the with the with the value of the neighborhood and and the um, I guess the um, general demographic of the they, of those neighborhoods. But they want to come in and build. Like we were already there before they came to build. They want to come and just have us relocate so they can be there. You get right, it? right, right, right. Well, part, you're coming to us to not to us, but to that street and. Part part of that part of that is, and I'll and I'll and I'll talk to it as a, okay. you know as as an outsider to to the whole thing. Part of it is that the city or or whoever is uh, doing the the logistics planning for for the routing, it goes through the most fucked up streets and the most poorest of neighborhoods because they don't have a voice. And this yeah. is part. This is part of why the community is so upset. It's like yes. all these people for living there. I mean, it, it, you know, there it, it's already bad enough where where they're at and everything. But then on top of that, they get the bad end of the stick by making the truck route right through there, purposely. Like, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't see these 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 types of things going. Like, let's just say that they they build a dam core or something right here in Palos Verdes. Uh, how you think? How easy you think that would be? It's like it wouldn't be easy at all. It would be impossible, kind of, to make a warehouse right up there, because the community would not allow it. The people wouldn't allow it, mm -hmm. and it's just because oh, it's gonna mess up the streets or this or that, and it's a quality of life and everything. But yet they target certain areas where it's, you know, low low end uh, low low income low income communities and involved. everything, in, in, and it's not involved mm -hmm. and everything. And they just kind of always get shot down. So I think this is bringing a lot of light to that. Yeah. Because now we got multi-billion dollar companies trying to build and, and, and everything. But they want to put the roads right through the communities that are more affected by it. Instead of them benefiting from it, hmm. we're just going right through there. Yeah. But they don't seem to get any 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 budget, budget cost to that. And I know it's true what you said that the communities that have less people speaking out get taken advantage of because... There was a lady on there that mentioned when there was building around there, it, the ground was shaking, right? Yeah. And it caused cracks on her home, right? And she complained. Yeah. And then they came back and guess what they told her? Oh, um, well, no one else complained. So, you know, we're, we're not going to cover that because... Mm -hmm. No one else complained. It's just you, so that's kind of strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's 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 always and and again, it, it always happens to Raza. It happens to the mm. black community. It happens to to the minorities. And you know, like I said, you wouldn't see this in Palos Verdes because it's kind of impossible to go up there and do this. And I'm not uh, justifying that in any kind of way. It's just 
we really need to revisit and every time they're going to apply for a permit or for something look at all the different angles not just unilateral not just one one simple objective yeah. you know i think that's what bugs me the most that people just make decisions and then it's like all right truckers um now this is what's up <laughs> go that way yeah and then we get over there hey um we don't want you here either why don't you go this way yeah well, we're a part of this community too even though we don't live in it we operate and we, we do our part you know to anyways i don't so, want to so so with the whole thing yeah. on drum street and everything it's not until we started talking to some other people that that they kind of understood yeah. our side to it it's yeah. like we don't want to go through their street I, I mean it bothers me every time we have to go through there because you're going to be stuck there in a long line just to get out of the uh, out of um Kong global or harbor division you're going to be stuck in a long line right there and yeah. as a as a as a resident, just imagine just trying to get out of your house to go to the store and buy some milk. It's like now you have a line of truckers that, you know, it's hard to get in, hard to get out. You know, it's a nuisance to a, to a lot of the community. But um, like we've expressed to them, it's that's the only truck route that there is available for that. the The alternative to that was closed down by the rail operations, and we still haven't been outreached by any of the community leaders. Um, not not community like let's just say uh officials city officials mm -hmm. to try to alleviate some of that i mean if you want to call this a little bit of a call out for for buscaino to see some alternatives on um, how to fix this issue then let's do that and he let, do let's that? do it for what it is and if you know if we get enough uh, enough uh signatures and the community involved enough and and we show them that there's no other alternative to get there mm -hmm. they can at least give us an alternate route to it instead of going over here we can probably go through a uh, bank which is also a no truck zone right now and then uh you know i think there's enough going on to the trucking community and we're being uh, bottom of the barrel for, for, for the residents. We're being bottom of the barrel for enforcement. We're being bottom of the barrel for everything. But we need some kind of uh, outreach because we're right at the at the waterfront for the biggest, uh, you know, port Yeah, are you going to be in the, in the, in the, in the, right in the heart of global trade and complain that you see trucks? Exactly. exactly. And then Eubank might be a solution, but not really. It's because, not, it's not really a solution. Because there's other homes there as well. Now they're going to complain. Like, right. They want us to teleport now. Like, what are we going to do? We yeah. got to get there somehow. I think the, the the solution goes back even to port operations. They need mm -hmm. to they need to be more involved and get specific routes that are that, that don't involve the community and, and these depots that are that we're accessing through the small communities are no longer needed. If we can if we can get the, the terminals to be efficient at receiving mm -hmm. their own equipment, at receiving their empties and at moving everything, we're not asking anything outside of the norm. We are just asking them to do their jobs, to mm -hmm. receive the empties. And to let us get our loads when 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 they're available. Do you think it has anything to do with the jurisdiction that runs that area? Like uh, Wilmington would be LA area, so Port of LA, yep. right? And Long Beach would probably. How do you think Long Beach would handle that situation? Because in throughout history, Long Beach has always kind of the funds from terminal operations and all that. They kind of put it back into the city. Yep. And create jobs and all this stuff. So. I wonder if, if at this point, who do you think we should reach out to? To, You know, I don't want to be like the crazy lady that was at that meeting last time uh, saying that, that Steve Jobs should 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 do everything because he has the money. But I'm no, just saying, like, I, what, what, how can they I give think, back to the what, community with the solutions? I mean, with to contribute to solutions for the problems caused, caused by their operations. So so this is one of the – this is a very good question, actually. Um I was thinking of alternative ways. We kind of brainstormed it with a couple of people, and, and we've been at it. And Long Beach, although it is part of L.A., it's its own city. So it's able to make its own choices and to redistribute the funds. City of Wilmington, it's not its own city. It's a part of an unincorporated L.A., so they still yeah. go down through downtown, through L.A., through everything. Yeah. So L.A. has a big... San big, Pedro fell into that category right. as well. So, 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 and, and I think one of the quickest and not quickest because it, it will take a lot of signatures and everything is for Wilmington to become an independent city so that they can have jurisdiction, they can have their own funds, they can have everything. And it's a matter of getting, getting yeah. signatures. There's but a, they signed off on that themselves long ago, but the, you can do that though. And Again, I, bring we get, it back up. yeah, we can bring mm. it back up. We can bring it back on the ballot, get the community involved, get the trucking community involved. Mm. And if we get all the support from all these people and make uh, Wilmington an independent city, then 
you know, then then they have more jurisdiction and more say Imagine as to they how get funds little, get traveled. They get their mayor and everything. They get everything, yeah. And 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 that's kind of uh, where where I th- I think the solution to most of this is going to go. It it's it just needs the right political attention and the, the right political fog to just cover everything. See, politics. This sounds like we're getting into politics. Politics yeah. is more strategic and paperwork and knowing laws and code and all this shit. And as residents, we're more visual of like face value. Right. We see a truck. We hear the noise. We, of course, we're gonna complain about that because that's where we're living. See, you so, nicked it in the butt. So you said we see a truck, we hear it, we see it. Now imagine seeing 20, 30, 40 trucks lined up outside of your house every single day. The rumbling, the noise, the uh, complaints, uh, mm-hmm. you know, even the static on your TV, I'm pretty sure it goes off because of all this other commotion that goes on. Mm-hmm. So it's, I know they're tired of, 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 of us going through that street, but we still don't have an alternative to get to it. So Now imagine if, I don't want to put names on it, but if some entity gave back to those residents, like, hey, we're sorry, this is the best we can do for now. This is the only road we have, right. access, but here we're going to... You know, maybe the the home, the sales tax, or what do you call it? The the road ho- tax. Homeowners pay oh. pay certain tax a year, right? Yeah, yeah, the, the property tax. Maybe we'll, we'll nick that. I don't know. I'm just imagining shit. Maybe we'll eliminate your tax this year or something for the inconvenience. Or is that like wishful thinking? I'm just saying, like. No, that that that's actually right like, right on there. Solid. Like, like I can't do that, but here I know what you're going through. Let me show you that I really give a shit. And and a lot of the people don't know what people are going through because they don't see it firsthand. Yeah. So. Yep, yep, yep. Um. Okay, moving on. Is that cool? No, yeah, let's do it. So. Oh, you mentioned Buscaino. Mm-hmm. And that kind of stemmed from that. So I think we're not done with that. So. What's the difference? I mean, what does it matter who it is? It's a local it's council. Seems, well, no, no, no. And, and, and again, it's, but it it's always for, seems it's like for we, the local elected yeah. officials. It's a local. And, yeah. and since he's he's in the hot seat right now because yeah. he is in, in, that, in that position, I think. Uh, well, with, with even more reason. Right. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. So how, that's what I. Excuse me. That kombucha coming in hot. <laughs> and but, it's not dairy. So imagine if it was. Yeah. What I mean is that. We always tend to go like, who will save us? Maybe now this politician, maybe now that. Like, and then even Garcetti at some point, they had him looking like an angel. Like, he, and now, I, and from just an opinion of what I see, a lot of people don't like him. So, like, wh- where do these politicians go wrong when they stop working for the people, or what? Wh- no, do their hands get no, tied I the think, deeper I think they the, get? I think the intention is always there to do good or for the greater good. At least at the start. Even in the start or even everything. But I think once they start seeing that it's uh, it's more than just a, a simple let's do this, let's do that. Mm. Because a lot of people have to get involved and a lot of have to people get have to get on board. Oh, okay. Organizing so anything, it's, so it's, a, a, it's okay. a job within itself. It's like yeah. it's even a lot though, of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, and it's it's a lot more red tape to it. It's not it's not as easy as oh, I'm the mayor, let's get this done. I'm the city official, let's All get right. this done. We still need approval. We still need funding. We still need to there there's there's a whole lot of steps that get have to be done, and sometimes people just get tired of just constantly going against current. You know, they they just get tired of it. Yeah. What if he was here? What could we ask him? What kind of conversation you think we would be having right now? Well, if he was if he was here, I think I'd ask him for for what's what's his uh, I I think what what's his opinion first off of the situation that we're going through, and what his outtake is on on how to solve the issue, and then mm. from there just just hear him out. Let let's see what initiatives he has for it, what plans he has ahead of us, and how we can actually make this work. How how we mm. can make, it's not just asking something from somebody. It's how can I get the community involved how can i get the truckers involved how can i reach out to my guys that are following me that are mm-hmm. that are constantly to do something collectively with you so that we can do the, the so we can do things right and we we can improve things mm. it's not just give me give me give me it's let's work no, together no, some stuff has to make sense I, I would ask like why during this uh supply chain crisis out of all the times this could be done why is it now that like again my source for this is from Instagram, and okay. it, it, it. I remember seeing their logos, the his name and all that watermark on a video about uh, 
towing containers and towing trucks parked on the street. But hold on, why? Why did why does that make sense to you to do that now in the middle of the supply chain issue, and not tow like unregistered RVs and clean up the streets from that? Like, you're that's not helping us. The the reason those containers are on the street is as we mentioned earlier that there's a shit show going on and and we're just doing the best we can to get it going and get back on track. He's not helping is what I mean. I, th I think he called out enforcement or court enforcement. It's his parking. It could be traffic. It could yeah. be whatever. He called it out on us because we had been making too much noise. There was a couple of accidents uh, that had happened in the not too, you know, not too far from that, from those dates. And the, that's when the, when all the community started coming together, all the residents, and they started complaining a, a lot about the trucks. Now, having said that, as a politician, you always want approval from your community. If you don't, if you live there and if you are part of the neighborhood, you yeah. at least want to be heard. And the way to do that is to cause a big scene and, 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 and you know, come out on the news, towing all the stuff yeah. and towing everything that is harming or, or potentially uh, as an eyesore to you, as, to you as a community. Um, realistically, if you wanted to do that, it, it would start with... Um, with outreach programs and, and alleviation for a lot of the traffic, a lot of the stuff that goes on for the businesses that are in the community and for the port area and just to see, to try to see how to make things work more efficiently. Number two is um, because the, the neighborhoods or the, the city members or the, the, um, the residents were not complaining yet about the cleaning up and everything, he had to make noise, or politicians or whoever it was, had to make noise and make a statement that, oh, yeah, we're cleaning up the streets and everything, and if containers are, are, are a nuisance to you, let's tow everything. And that's exactly what they did. It was more of a political strategy than, than anything, just to keep... But see, you take from something, that affects something else. It's, it's not a permanent solution. Maybe it alleviated their concerns, but now the truckers were impacted, and the companies, the carriers the 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 owner of that yeah and and, I, and I and I saw and I saw the report on 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 the news even the, tow, it was, even the tow company that did it got a lot of heat for it like oh yeah it was and, Pepe's they, they no it was another one Pepe's an OPG oh that was one of them <laughs> yeah that was one of them because my, my containers got towed to Pepe's so <laughs> yeah there was another one as well and then they just deleted their video because they were not going to be uh, arguing with people on the gram you the, know? the 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 enforcing officers that were out there for on on that detail were um were were very uh they came out on the news and everything and one of their things where they were calling it a, a a win a win for Wilmington because they cleaned up the city and they cleaned up all this stuff that day that day yeah exactly but was it really a win I mean it was just I think more of a political stunt than a, than a win but again it, it it's all in the politics that's bad because if they consider it a win what do you do when you win you leave the field right right this battle's won. Nothing to fix here. Yep, and that's and that's kind of what happened. You go out there and look at all the homeless people that are trafficking that area. That you know all the foot traffic that goes on after eight nine o'clock. I wouldn't want I, I wouldn't want any female or any anybody for that matter walking around those neighborhood streets because to it's, pick up an empty to pick up an empty or to do this. Yeah, right. End you up know? in the empty. End Shit. up in the empty <laughs> with a couple of holes. You know, it's like no. Yeah. And yeah, that's those are all issues that that I hate. That every time we talk about stuff like that, if it, I kind of catch myself, and it sounds like I'm complaining, like, and people hate complainers. But are you, are you being I, a Karen? No, uh, I'm just <laughs> saying that. Like, uh, see, I understand the level of responsibility the people face, like uh, Buscaino or the the Sandoval lady, or you know, like whoever they're yeah. putting the face on it. Like it takes. Right you know courage to put yourself out there like that as well right and you can make miracles but i guess instead of this sounding like a complaining session let's just say that this is our point of view and you never know what if he could hear us out since he's next up yeah we could organize some kind of like meet up like how do the truckers feel about this how can we all come up with a solution well one is because we haven't organized ourselves Oh, ouch. so yeah, no, no, and that yeah. and that's just and that's just one of one of the things is, you know, we need to get organized ourselves. Now, 
having said that, it's not that we haven't done it or anything. It's just we haven't come into a collective and, and done it efficiently. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've made great progress using all the social media and using all these different groups that, that are now out there. You know, we got people that are that are that are in the trucking industry that are willing to help out that, you know, with different groups, containers groups, LA Long Beach board drivers and everything. Everybody kind of feels a little bit of uh, of um, stay close to the mic, buddy. Oh, there you go. Speak into the mic. It's right there. Okay. There we go. Let me see. No, no. <laughs> like that sexy ASMR. Hey, yeah, what's up, weird. buddy? What you were saying? Let me know. <laughs> continue, continue. All right, let's let's do this. Um, but with uh with all these port groups that we had with social media and using it efficiently, like um, street turns and chassis and. We we try to we're trying to do something for ourselves since we haven't got any outreach from anybody else. We're thinking, we're we're pretty much taking things into our own accountability, finding empties, finding chassis, finding help, finding mechanics, finding anything, and um and we're slowly coming back together. But like I said in the beginning of the of the program, it's a lot of these guys have been hurt in the past really bad, really really bad, and they're skeptical about trusting any one person or any one entity and putting all their eggs in that basket because if it spills again, it's mm-hmm. starting back from scratch and from zero. Especially when that sacrifice takes out of the food on the table. That's right. That, yeah. yeah it's, it's literally the, their, their family's on their, you know. It's on their back. And they're going to vouch for that movement and then let their family down because it didn't work. So yeah. It's like, mm. So. Continue, continue. Um. I had uh, congestion, interruption of supply chain. Well, the, the, the congestion and interruption and everything, I think it, uh, more than anything, more than the influx or the spike in, uh, in cargo volumes that we've had, because we moved it efficiently. I think, uh, ironic enough, the 10 million container was out of APL some uh, late, uh, earlier on in the year, and I think uh, Garcetti and a couple of people were out there you know, celebrating that that they moved a the ten million container they and did. yeah, yeah, and then it's like, and they did, mm. um, but all those containers moved out of the terminal and moved out somehow, some way. And yeah. us truckers, we did the whole job. We took no credit into that shit. Yeah, we took no recognition. We took nothing. We what we got is probably short ended. And um, your shit told. And pretty much, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because all these loads that, that are out there is like now we got them empty and there's nowhere to put them, bro. <laughs> where where do you where do you put the empty? So, I think um, for a long time we've had the supply chain kind of uh, being administered or being um, being held at ransom by, by. I was gonna ask you what do you think of. Never mind. Yeah, that, that's a better word. Yeah, uh, being held at ransom to to to. A smaller organization you know it's, it's such a small group of people that we're allowing to just take the cargo at ransom and we're at their grace and and whatever they say goes and whatever they they however they want to manage their 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 negotiation it's it's on them and as now that it's a global issue i think we can really shed light on it and and renegotiate and actually make a difference on it instead of just being uh you know, single vision, it's, no, there's also other parts to it. And that, that, that takes a lot to do with it. Like somebody is out there controlling the, the, um, the valve to in and outlet, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a water hose. Somebody's right there on the, on the valve and not, not letting enough water through when they should just, you know, let it rip because we're in need. We, we need these supplies. We need to get this stuff moving. But, oh, no, because my contract says that I cannot open it more than halfway. I can't. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference is that that we can now voice and we can now shed light on, you know. Would you like something to drink, by the way? I can go get you a Diet Coke or a... No, 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 we're good. We're good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, You mentioned we negotiate. Speaking of that, you know, this this year is a contract year. For who? For the ILWU, how do you think that what can what can we expect during this time? I think part of the backlog to the whole thing is exactly that they're holding the whole country hostage, and this is my personal opinion. Okay. No, nobody okay. else is. They're holding the whole the whole country hostage with their goods, with the supply, and with the speed uh, or, or with the speed of the traffic that goes in and out of the terminals to optimize their negotiating hand. If, if they can get more money out of it because all of a sudden they're going to start demanding 
more hours, more people, more this, more and more and more and more and more because now we have big volume. It's like, yeah, but most of it is self-inflicted, you know. it's uh, You cannot go out and, and cry wolf when we're the ones that were, you know, that, that self-caused it. Mm-hmm. So we just need to get, I guess, other entities to come in and monitor and just kind of mediate and make sure that, that they get what they want. So if they get what they want, then we'll be good, you think? It's still not it, going it, to happen. It'll trickle down to us because now they got what they want. and now. It'll, be, it'll be good for a couple of years because every time they, they have a renewed contract, yeah. it, it goes good. And then all of a sudden when it's time to renegotiate and to do everything, then they slow it down again. And it's, you know, it, it, it's just part of the mechanism that we have to really revisit. What's the purpose? Do you know why there has to be contracts? Like, what? One of the biggest things. Um, How long are they, anyways? I think one of them. One of them is indefinite. That that um, that was signed on by Harry Bridges. Okay. And and it goes way back to the initial, you know, to the to the grounds or to the roots of the IOWU. Yeah. Um, when he surrendered a lot of the bulk grain and a lot of the bulk loading on the containers. Oh, I'm the, sorry, the- onto the ships. The M and M agreement. The M and M. Modernization and mechanization. Mechanization, mechanization and modernization. Yeah. Tongue twister right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when that happened, um, they they surrendered a lot of the manual jobs for loading with the shovel, for yeah. loading this, for loading that at, at bulk or at green, and um, and they surrendered a lot of the jobs to to the containers because now it just revolutionized the whole shipping industry. It's it was never standardized before and now all of a sudden it yeah. became it became a new standard yeah. a lot of the people were upset at him from his own union because he surrendered all those jobs now in turn what he got was full jurisdiction of the waterfront so anything that has to come in and out has to be get processed within a 50 mile radius or it's just a waterfront let's mm-hmm. just say any job within the waterfront um, has to be done by an ILWU member and this is where they kind of have jurisdiction over the port, over the this, because every single job that is out there has to be done and performed by an ILWU member, which is why you can't change your lights inside the terminal. Yeah. You can't do this. You, it all belongs to a certain job thing. security. And this is and this is and and again we go back to the same thing when you asked earlier. It's like, well, what do you expect them, or what would you ask? to be changed it's like nothing i just want them to be efficient at what they do yeah that's it i think if they all did their jobs if all the mechanics that on the out gates were actually up and doing their job they would move those lines seamlessly they would just mm-hmm. keep them moving but sometimes you see them and they're on their phones or you know chatting away mm-hmm. whatsapp tiktok whatever they're doing and they'll look at you and mm-hmm. just disregard you entirely and you're like well i got a place to be i gotta be traffic I got to be there. I got to, you know, I got to make time for the kids. I got to pick them up from school. I got to whatever it is that you have to do. And they're just kind of taking something that you're not ever going to get back. And that's time, you know. And do you think he kind of slept on it? No. I think he didn't know it would happen so fast. Like where we're at now. Because, you know, he got something. He accepted something in exchange for something that will be deemed um extinct by the one thing he allowed right because now when automation comes through there's no it's but, taking long but, jobs, but i think so there won't be no need to protect no and by, and by all means jobs for longshoremen because what he accepted you right. get what i'm saying like, right 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 but i think i think um we're, we're used to such a system and such as they were back then when mm-hmm. he surrendered all the manual labor and all the yeah. stuff and everything that even um even if it is um even if it does become automated, the stuff still needs monitoring. It still needs certain skills, and it still requires certain mm-hmm. people. And I think um, they're they're going through the same little bit of a of a setback what what he went through back then. Like, okay, now we're now we have a future ahead of us. This is a new future. How do we adapt to that so that we still have the pull? We still have yeah. the muscle that we yeah. have. Um, you know, and keep in mind the population is way greater than it was back then. Right, so. right. Mm. So it, it it it's still something that they have. Well, we have to adapt to, and we have to kind of do it collectively between trucker terminal yeah. and 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 the whole thing. Um, because one of the other arguments is that trucks are coming too, and they're going to be automated. 
And it's like, well, yeah. And, and when it does, we have to adapt to it. And that's just, that's just reality. We have to, we don't, we don't go um, unscathed from that. We know, we see it, but it's not here yet. We're not slowing down stuff just because, you know, there's going to be an automated truck that's going to be coming over. It's like, we're just going to have to start working towards it and with it. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, this can go on all day, but yeah. we're running out of time. <laughs> I got a couple, maybe like two more. Uh, I got a request for you to stop turning the... Oh, this is chair. my this is my little OC and no, my my little uh what is it ADD. <laughs> uh, Port Ops Empty Returns Oakland LA LB Initiative. Mm. There's there's one thing that uh that I I, I kind of left out keywords um, keywords. Yeah yeah these are these are the did keywords. Did that strike activate something? Yeah, it did, it did, it did. Um, back in the in the Drake Tech, uh, the past uh, September, whenever it was in September, that all three of the commissioners for the port were there. Okay. Uh, it was Port of LA, Long Beach, and Port of Oakland. All three of them were there. Um, I waited in the in the heat till pretty much the end, and I think I was the last uh, mm -hmm. the last question that I, that I asked, and I told them. They talked about the problems. They talked about um, the backlog that they had at the water, the whole yada, thing. Yada, 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 and I told them, yeah. and that is freaking perfect. You've already done half of the job already because you've already identified all the problems that we have, but you have not given us one solution. You know that the problems are there, and that's half the job already. Knowing what the problem is is half the job. Now let's do the other half. What are you doing to outreach to the truckers, to the community, to the people? to alleviate some of the stresses for this. Why not? And then I suggested it. And again, I'm not going to take, you know, I'll take the credit, but I won't take the credit. Let's just put it that way. I suggested, why don't we have a terminal exclusively for receiving and terminating empties from all the different steamship lines? They're not going to process one load, no loads. Let's just do empties. Because right now what we're having a backlog of is also people that are doing their exports that don't have an empty at the terminal because the terminal hasn't accepted anything. So there's, you know, there's all these communities, all these uh, port groups that are doing street turns and this and that. And yeah. it, it just becomes a whole different hassle. Why don't you just have one that's going to receive your empties and dispatch your empties? And that way you have a empty terminal facility and it's going to alleviate the stresses of all the traffic that are going in and out of the port. And it's going to alleviate some of the chassis stresses to put more chassis available on the on the road. Now, I don't know if Port of Oakland was out there listening, but he's starting out a pilot program that is doing exactly that for all the growers and all the traffic that is going to get missed right here by the terminals not calling LA. He's going to reap the fruits of it up there in Oakland. They're doing a whole big part in Oakland just to receive empties and put out empties for all the growers and all the exporters in the Central Valley so they can get their product out because the economy still needs to grow. It still needs to, you know, keep going. So, you know, big thumbs up for Port of Oakland for at least uh, putting that pilot program out there. Um, and I think we're just, that that's another one of the things that I, we're just too much uh, bureaucracy and we're just trickling down and taking things a little too slow. Yeah, at that point, it becomes a real estate thing here. Yeah. Right? So, what is PRS? Is PRS something similar or not really? PRS is is it, it was controlled by by Pasha. I don't know who took over the the whole lease, but it was part of the Long Beach area. So it's it's PRS. I think it's an initiative to try to get something like that going. Um, but again, have you been in there? We used to operate I never that got, terminal. I never got to go there. We used to operate that terminal. Oh yeah, a, a while back. Um, one of the carriers that I worked for in the past, mm -hmm. we we took possession of that. We had to hire IOWU people to come oh, yeah, in and, and operate the, the gates and the whole, yeah. the whole thing. And um, and it, it worked out really. What was that like? How do they reach out? Hey, by the way, you gotta hire us. Uh, it? it was it was too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Like who who comes who's watching and says, "Oh, we got a new tenant in town." So 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 ironic that you say that. It's uh it's all the other terminal managers. I got we had Kenny Hunter go out there from YTI. We oh, had yeah? the people from TTI go over. They visited us. They made sure that everything was kind of on point and everything. But eventually because they needed the land for the bridge for the mm-hmm. bridge, mm-hmm. they kind of ejected us from 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 doing that, but we we did pretty good. And uh, but now it's doing the same thing. Now it's that... doing the same thing. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting so. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not your idea. It's my idea. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. But you know. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else you want to add that I might have not asked? Um. I asked you already what we as uh, port drivers ask or. Or what you ask, what? No, and um, let's see what else. No, oh, I think uh, I think that's it. I think uh, it should shed some light on uh, on some of the issues, and and hopefully it opens up dialogue to some of the future conversations that not only we can have, but um, the whole community can get involved with. Okay, and and where can where can they reach you if anyone has any questions? You have any social media or a email, or whatever I do, you want to share. I do, and I and I kind of kidnapped it from you a while back. El Containero at, oh, at, yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> you can reach uh, reach out at El Containero on Instagram. Yeah, we had a little bit of a history, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my name, not it's yours. Mine, not yours, kind of thing. Yeah, one of those. The, yeah, yeah, it stuck, right? It's stuck. You liked yeah. It? El, is there any underscore? No, huh? Nope. El Containero. At El Containero. E-L-K-O-N. Like that, without the Z. E-A-I-N-E-R-O. Without the Z. Yeah, without the Z. That's it. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. And I hope we didn't bore you. Yeah, wave at, at, <laughs> oh. wave at the YouTube people. YouTube. And then I'll say goodbye to the Spotify people. Oh, you got Spotify on this yeah, thing? Yeah. All right. Hey, goodbye, Spotify people. Yeah. We'll no, I just made it awkward. Goodbye, uh, just, ASMR, yeah. yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. We'll see you. Should I start typing this shit? <laughs> <laughs>